let's move on to the industry symposium by Sidus. We have a talk and which will be followed by a panel discussion. For the talk on clinical utilities of tracrolimus, once daily formulation in kidney transplant. May I invite the speaker, Professor Dinesh Kullar, the chairman of nephrology and renal transplant medicine, Max Super Specialty Hospital, New Delhi. I would like to invite the chairpersons for this session, Professor R.K. Sharma, Director and Head of Department, Nephrology and Kidney Transplant Medicine, Medanda Institute, Lucknow, and Professor Vijay Kher, Chairman of Kidney and Urology Institute, Medanda. Over to the chairpersons. Thank you. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, and this is a session on single dose tecrolimus. And I, on behalf of uh, Dr. Sharma, welcome you to this session. This is going to be a one hour session in which Dr. Kuller is going to talk first on the advantages of a single and he will bring us, bring us up to date on what is the current status of clinical use of single dose tecrolimus and followed by Dr. Sundar is going to take you over as a moderator for the panel discussion. And then he's going to take up all the questions. The question paper he had leaked already earlier, I think. And I'm sure the answers are going to be given by a very, very elite panel there. And before any further ado, I think I'll request uh, Professor uh, Dinesh Kola to talk about single day, single dose picrolimus. First of all, my sincere thanks to the organizing committee for this wonderful opportunity. And, and I'm already nervous uh, sitting amongst the galaxy of the Indian uh, nephrology and transplant physician stars here. Uh, nervous, but then nevertheless, the topic is so important that I would certainly want to learn from my colleagues around. And let me uh, present my perspective on the clinical utilities of tecrolimus once daily formulation in kidney transplantation. Well, um, we all know about uh, the, the relevance of tecrolimus. Ever since it was launched, made available to us way back in 1994, it has really revolutionized the field of kidney transplantation. But we are also aware of the limitations of tecrolimus. We know how narrow therapeutic index it has, and, and thereby we have to be very, very careful, almost on our toes all the time, if we have to be very um, um, cautious about the possibility of going haywire, either way, this way or the other. Well, the problems with uh, tecrolimus are the high intra as well as interpatient variability, the short half-life, which requires very high adherence. We all know that tecrolimus is a macrolide and it, it acts via inhibition of IL-2 production. And it's much more potent than cyclosporin. And as I said, it's the main uh, immunosuppressing uh, expressive agent which we are using uh, around 90% of our patients are currently on TAC-based regimes. Uh, but we also need to recapitulate as to uh, um, what the, the gene polymorphism can play a role in the metabolism of uh, tecrolimus. We know it's metabolized by cytochrome P450, 3A, um, and mainly uh, 4 and 5. The 5, C3A5 is what we are really interested in. What is important to note is that if your patient is, is homozygous for one allele of the, of the CYP3A5, is going to be a, a, an expressor, which means he'll be metabolizing the drug quite fast as compared to if he, has, he or she has allele of three, uh, which means the person, the patient, is going to be a slow metabolizer. That's one. Equally important is to know how will it translate into clinical usefulness when we know that your patients are taking intermittent or uh, sorry immediate release tecrolimus formulation which which gets released in the stomach or in the upper part of GIT where you have a lot of uh, CYP35 uh, activity and there's going to be a very fast metabolism and the drug is going to reach the blood within an hour so thereby you will get a load of the drug within an hour would cause nephrotoxicity, but would be out of the system pretty much soon, though the area under the curve may actually suffer. So you have to keep in mind your patient's uh, uh, um, genetics, and that's why we rely on the drug levels so keenly, at least in the initial part of the transplantation. And even then, we never can afford to forget about them even later in the course. 
but we need to understand a very important concept and i i think we need to uh uh, uh um discuss a lot about the intra patient variability see we are seeking newer molecules uh um, believing that probably we are not really satisfied with what cni is and uh, in general and tag in particular has offered to us we are looking at uh, newer molecules probably because of the fact that we believe more can be achieved while i think we probably are lacking uh, or or uh, not able to extract maximal mileage out of what tecrolimus can offer us well the the intra patient variability is when the levels of tecrolimus in a given patient over a period of time change when we have not really changed the dose of the patient's uh, 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 drug so so obviously we have to be mindful of many factors and these factors i think we cannot overemphasize the uh, fact that food and drug interactions have uh, to be very carefully looked into innocuous things like grapefruit juice can play have a herbal medicines which one may believe are innocuous can play havoc and of course i have already talked about the genetic factors and in the genetic factors what needs to remember is that if your patient is heterozygous for sip 3a5 1 and 3 alleles probably there will be a lesser chance of intra patient variability while if he or she is homozygous for either the chances of intra patient variability is going to be tremendous and if your patient shows intra patient variability of more than 30% it's a bad news and we'll come back to that in a short while as i said while we are seeking your molecules let's try and see whether we have been unfair to tecrolimus or not because we so many times forget the importance of medication non adherence and we all know that the significance could lie in almost 50% of the patients and the most notorious being the young the teenagers the Uh, the non uh, compliant patients and and only once they have uh, lost the graft will they realize their foolishness well if there is high tac intra patient variability you can expect higher chances of acute rejection definitely more chances of dean over donor specific antibody production and the rapid pro progression of histological lesions if your patient already is showing uh, some on the biopsy well uh, as i said we we are looking we are very happy with what we have achieved on a short term basis but when we look at the long term survival of renal transplant uh, grafts in our patients a uh, lot yet to be achieved and and when we try to analyze as to what went wrong we always blame both the immunological factors and the non immunological factors i would draw your attention to the occurrence of de novo donor specific antibodies which we know is responsible for the late graft loss and as far as the occurrence of de novo dsas are concerned it's sub optimal exposure of tac or the immunosuppression or the non adherence to treatment are are very strong contributors now when we look at other factors as to what can cause uh intra patient variability as you move down from the weak evidence to strong modifiable factors and as you move from uh factors which may have probably low role to play such as the such as the biological rhythm of your patient the pharmacogenetics you can't do anything about well you have to be careful about the generic substitution the drug formulation the 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 analysis the tool which you are using to assess stack levels the various gi disorders because we know contrary to what happens in cyclosporin patients with on tecrolimus are going to get elevated levels uh, during diarrhea episodes and i've already talked about the interaction uh, uh, which you have to be careful about as far as the herbal or other nutritional innocuous so called uh, supplements or constituents are concerned but i would draw your attention not just to drug drug interactions which has already been highlighted in the previous uh, talk also by dr ramular but i would also uh, want to bring home the point that medical non adherence as i've already alluded to has a very very big role to play and if we can find something which can um, enable our enable our patients to stick more to or adhere to the uh, uh, drugs in a more appropriate manner i think uh, we would have made a huge difference well uh, again taking a step further 
well, how does intrapatient variability uh, translate into something meaningful? Well, it has a direct correlation with the graph survival, and and we we can actually calculate intrapatient variability via uh, something called a coefficient of variation. We take the standard deviation, uh, uh, the the sum of uh, two standard deviations, uh, and divided by the mean. We we can come out, we can figure out what is the intrapatient variability, and as I already said, if it is more than thirty percent. you can expect a poorer or an inferior graph survival in your patient it can have a a, a, a direct role in in acute rejection because as i said uh, ipv variability uh, thereby could actually mean non adherence and all this translates into occurrence of de novo uh, donor specific antibodies and we all know the kind of menace it plays as far as the the graph survival in the long run is concerned even though we have not really found a correlation between uh, uh, intrapatient variability and occurrence of uh, chronic antibody mediated rejection but if your patient has already developed cmr uh, the chances that he or she will progress further are much higher if your patient has an intrapatient variability um, of more than 30% and the histological lesions if you if you pick them at an early stage and now go back to your patient's ipv again you can correlate that if your patient falls in that uh, uh, bad uh, turtle of 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 the uh, population obviously you can expect a uh, further problem uh, in the progression of these lesions now the the as i said the occurrence of donor specific antibodies we all know are highly associated with antibody mediated rejection Uh, and as well as uh, allograft loss in the long run but what you have to uh, uh, also bear in mind is that apart from the other factors such as induction therapy and the concomitant medication and the overall immunosuppressive uh, load uh, you have to keep in mind tetrolimus intrapatient variability so you can see as to what kind of emphasis do i really want to uh, really uh, put on the intrapatient variability now taking it a step further if the if the variability is is not very significant you can be little uh, um, at peace that maybe your patient is not at big risk but if the standard deviation is more than 2.5 nanograms look at where the failure probability of the graph goes and it has been seen seen that 1 nanogram per ml uh, increase in standard deviation uh, translates into something like 27% composite risk of acute rejection late graft loss and death uh, in in a very interesting uh, article by sapir ishad se so so that's the kind of importance i would want to uh, give to intrapatient variability and let's try and see if we can do something to to eliminate or minimize the the occurrence of uh, this very relevant uh, point well as far as the safety of tact is concerned we have always been told told that there is an entity called cna toxicity over the period of time we have realized that it probably was not the culprit the real culprit was when we wanted to go low on on immunosuppression and we burnt our fingers by a chronic antibody mediated rejection occurring via you know donor specific antibody so if you have a uh, mmf based regime you should try and have a uh, tact levels Uh, in 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 the uh, more appropriate range that's more than 5 and you can uh, as as was shown by transform data and i think that's uh, 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 debatable whether you would want to go low if you have the addition of uh, mtor inhibitors available to your patient well it's not just about the the uh, uh, the tac levels being in the range it is the time for which they were in the range and and in this study song et al divided their patients in in into those who remained in the high uh, um, the the time in the therapeutic range was more than 78% versus when it was less than 78% and what they found was that if your patient was in the uh, uh, higher uh, it, it was in the time uh, in the therapeutic range was was higher than 78% you can expect better graft survival and rejection free survival well uh, interestingly the one may feel that by increasing 
the tac levels you are inviting trouble via infection that is not the case if you can avoid rejection probably the risk of getting infections also will be low so it's very relevant to to try and keep your patients in the therapeutic range of tacrolimus concentration uh, as long as uh, much as possible and what are the recommendations then well it's uh, we all know we know the importance of frequent uh, um, uh, trough level estimation when your patient is on a cni and of course the potential drug adherence problems as we've already talked about should be looked into drug drug interactions and we must at any cost avoid low levels of tacrolimus um, and and they should be at least the bare minimum to be able to prevent uh, uh, a t cell mediated rejection and in this and while trying to improve the compliance let us now see what kind of role can uh, shifting your patients from tacrolimus twice a day dose to once a dose once a daily dose uh, uh, can play now tacrolimus once daily a study found that 99.4% of the patients preferred it a significantly higher adherence rates have been associated with once daily tac compared to its pid alternative and a lower uh, uh, health related uh, quality of index uh, quality of life index was observed in patients taking uh, twice a day as compared to once daily formulation we talked to dr brennan other about uh, the other day about his take on this and he also was quite excited um, uh, about uh, the fact that Uh, twice a day makes things uh, difficult for the patient thrice even worse and four times a day if you have to take a medicine it makes the the task rather difficult so obviously once daily is going to be a preferable choice as long as it is safe it is equally efficacious now let us see if that indeed is the case comparing a uh, tacrolimus twice daily and and try and see if the convertibility was safe enough as was shown in this uh, study uh, in transplant proceedings the mean trough level was significantly higher in twice daily tacrolimus compared to once daily but the conversion uh, to once daily uh, patients was safe even though in this they had to uh, make an adjustment an increase of 8.3% in the tac dose uh, after 12 weeks Uh, post transplantation but this was with the prolonged release the data may be different uh, with uh, the other extended release that's the melt dose technology though not currently available in india but there uh, as i'll be showing subsequently you can expect significant reduction in the dose if you have converted your patients now the data which we have and that's by banas et al uh, you can see the prolonged uh, release tacrolimus in the, in the black bars Uh, is is the patients are likely to be in the range therapeutic range that's uh, five to fifteen nanograms per ml uh, when were, they were compared with the immediate release tacrolimus. Now this is a meta analysis although the number is is not huge but still whatever data we have uh, says that there is a thirty percent lower risk of uh, biopsy proven acute rejection episodes in the extended release tag group versus immediate release tag group. at one year post kidney transplantation and there was no difference in the patient survival and graft survival uh, so if this is the case obviously one would want to go in for uh, uh, a formulation which can uh, probably ensure better compliance so we we have our own experience from india as well this is uh, our uh, uh, phase 4 uh, uh, multicentric uh, 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 trial which we had conducted a uh, few years back and was published in indian journal of transplantation in 2017 as i said it was phase 4 um, and it was a 12 weeks uh, uh, um, uh, data of patients uh, undergoing both kidney as well as uh, liver transplantation in the country um, adult patients between 18 and 64 uh, were included and we we uh, could see uh, a 10% uh, uh, chances of uh, rejection in um 11% rather in uh, the kidney transplant patients none in liver and thankfully most of these were uh, steroid uh, sensitive interestingly the the uh, the graft function was quite good over uh, the the study period uh, in both 
uh, the liver, as you can see here, and here is what typically happens in the kidney, improvement in the graft and the state. Uh, and, and we were also curious to know as to what could we see uh, as far as uh, the cholesterol or, or the lipids were concerned, at least on a short term, these three months, uh, we didn't have any issues uh, with once a day tetralimus. This was de novo, and we started a day prior and the dose of 0.2 milligram per kilo and, and quickly adjusted based on the levels. So the results of this, uh, although very short-term study, suggested that once daily tetralimus is well tolerated and efficacious with a low incidence of acute rejection in Indian patients undergoing both kidney and liver transplantation. Now let's see what more things come to mind when we are talking about uh, once a day uh, uh, tag. Minesh, Minesh, you, will, Minesh, you yeah. should summarize now. I'll, I'll two more minutes, sir, because I, I started a little late. So, so we have no debt in mind. We try to look whether this can cause any um, a difference in the no debt. Well, the 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 uh, metabolic uh, or the insulin sensitivity indices remain same, but the C peptide levels were lower, probably indicating that you can expect a lower insulin requirement. Now we have the 10-year data, 10-year efficacy published last year, December, and once a day tag has been shown to be equally efficacious and safe compared to those with twice daily TAC combination. The safety was also addressed in this optimized study, whereby they looked at if you were converting your patients to either the, the standard of care, which would mean you would continue managing their, maintaining their levels between six and 10 nanograms compared to uh, keeping them between uh, four to six, in the first uh, three months and then three to five, what was found was that even keeping the levels low in the Asian patients, we did not experience any difficulty and, and it would safely be uh, done without causing underexposure. Well, this is what I was referring to. Melt dose technology is one step ahead, whereby they are using very small molecules of polymers, which allow the drug to be released distally and thereby it, it bypasses the, the CYP35A, which is predominantly in the proximal uh, GIT, and thereby you can expect a reduction in the dose. So this, unfortunately, is not available, but people, uh, at least in the Western countries, are quite excited about Envarsus, as it's known there. So to conclude, a high tetralimus intrapatient variability and medical non-adherence are very important determinants of renal allograft uh, uh, survival. Patients with IPV of more than 30% should be termed as high risk, and we should be very careful about the occurrence of uh, uh, things going wrong, especially acute rejection or de novo uh, antibodies translating into graft loss later on. Conversion to once daily uh, formulation from other formulations has been found to be fairly safe and quite effective in kidney transplant patients. And apart from just uh, the improvement in compliance, we can also expect Possibly, although more data is required as far as we can, as far as the fact that whether we can expect any reduction in nephrotoxicity, neurotoxicity or tremors, uh, no doubt, or improved metabolic profile is concerned. We certainly need more data as far as that is concerned. Well, thank you very much. And I would certainly want more discussion because this is something very relevant to us all nephrologists in the country and world over as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dinesh, for the... Uh... Uh, excellent presentation and uh, bringing out uh, uh, how uh, different in parameters of variation in the TAC uh, levels with the same dose uh, can affect the graft outcome. And I think the panel discussion, uh, these questions will be taken up, whether only besides uh, the compliance, uh, other variables could also be addressed by the single dose uh, uh, formulation, because the single dose which we had, uh, the original by uh, the molecule, was so expensive that it was a deterrent uh, for its common use. Uh, so whether the pharmacological, pharmacodynamic, and genetic variations, and whether uh, the interference with the food uh, could be really uh, helped in some way uh, besides the compliance. Compliance remains the most important factor uh, by the single dose uh, formulation because you could be more careful uh, by 
that at the time you you're taking this formulation uh, those uh, uh, other interfering uh, simple things uh, are avoided so i think uh, uh, i would request uh, uh, dr sundar to go ahead uh, and moderate and the panel discussion uh, which will address uh, some of the points which uh, uh, dr sundar has raised dr uh, dr kolar has raised dr sundar please um at the outset uh, let me thank the organizers for giving me a chance to moderate this important session uh, we have had a excellent talk by dinesh and uh, chaired by uh, vijay and uh, sharma ji uh, we have had evidence based medicine i mean that's uh, what uh, we learned a lot of things many of the questions now is going to be experience based medicine and i have in my panel probably uh, the country's uh, top uh, nephrologists and transplant physicians who have done a lot of work on this so i am going to go in an order uh, which were uh, what the way i thought and uh, we have uh, uh, the panelists are uh, from different parts of india i go step by step and the first question is to all of you and this is actually will be what percentage of your patients are on od tacrolimus my own experience i analyzed the last 1000 transplants on tacrolimus maybe less than 100 are on uh, OD tracheotomies. The last hundred transplant only about five are on OD tracheotomies. So I would say five to ten percent of my patients are on OD tracheotomies. So I start off with the, my good friend and senior colleague, Dr. Vijay Kher. What is your take? Can't hear you. You are on mute, Vijay. You are on mute. Yeah, you are on mute. Sorry. Yeah, ten percent of my patients also are currently on once a day. Uh, tacrolimus and i think uh, that's probably going to be the the kind of an experience at the moment i put those patients who are having difficulty in achieving tacrolimus levels or have very high tac levels and i am not able to reduce the dose of tacrolimus and i find it difficult to make a twice a daily dose tacrolimus into alternate day daily or daily tacrolimus and i i, I would convert them to a single those tacrolimus in many of these patients patients with liver disease have very high tac levels and usually you require to reduce the dosages of the tacrolimus so those are the patients and then patients who are on azathioprine who are intolerant to mycophenolate morphotel in my experience about 20% patients of uh, transplant are not tolerant to mycophenolate morphotel i have to change them to tacro to azathioprine and with azathioprine giving a single dose those uh, drug is much easier because then patients don't have to take these drugs twice so it it becomes much easier to give these drugs once a day those okay. uh, next i go to uh, dr sharma rk sharma what is your uh, yeah uh, i i think uh, i agree with uh, vijay that uh, the use of single dose uh, uh, molecule is uh, is very less like i can say out of 3000 transplants it's not more than 2% uh, the main factor uh, is the cost uh, so only patients who can afford um, uh, because the cost also affects the compliance if the drug is too expensive and uh, the compliance will be affected so actually using a drug which is going to increase the compliance will actually reduce the compliance the other category which vijay has mentioned i think is an important uh, indication where uh, the levels are too high and we are not very clear why this is happening uh, then somehow the single dose uh, we are tempted to use uh, where you can go to the smallest single dose and help these patients so i agree it's a very less uh, utilization of this molecule uh, next dinesh what is your uh, on your experience So it's roughly about the same figure, so 10%, but predominantly only conversion. Uh, so we were fortunate, as I had shown in my study, that we could be part of De Novo. So we could develop that kind of confidence, which is, I think, difficult unless you have first-hand experience with uh, a De Novo. We have uh, resumed that, and with the availability of uh, uh, the same cost, at par cost, uh, Tacrolimus once a day formulation uh, from Zydus. we we have uh, enrolled quite a few patients for de novo and we are quite happy because we know that that we can achieve the same kind of levels within no time maybe we start with a higher dose that's 0.15 mg rather than 0.1 uh, and we can we can but most of the times what dr sharma said uh, we we are compelled to use a very uh, 
uh, to convert them because the dose on uh, take twice a day is something like uh, a point two five twice a day, and yet the levels are very high, and that's when we resort to uh, once daily. Okay, now I go to the, my fellow panelists, starting with uh, my dear friend. Uh, Padmashri Balla, Chairman of Nephrology from Sir Gangaram Hospital. Balla ji, Anil Balla, my good friend, what is your experience? Percentage yes. of patients on OD tacrolimus. Good afternoon, Dr. Sundar. Uh, we have about 5% of patients who are on uh, single dose tap. And not, no patient is on de novo. All the patients are usually conversion. And conversion is the only indication of for conversion is when the uh, levels are very high, even at a dose of 0.25 milligram BD. Otherwise, we are not uh, using de novo routinely. And as far as the adherence is concerned, or compliance is concerned, somehow I don't agree with the figures of 30% or 50%. The kind of exercise our patients have to go to get a transplant living, living related donation, I am I'm, I'm somehow not uh, agree, agree, agree to this fact that we have 30% or 50% non-adherence in our patients. And other thing is that uh, conversion, we are doing it milligram to milligram basis. No, Balaji, I'll come to it later on. You're going yes. to get that. But I sure, just sure. want a rough uh, ballpark figure. What percentage of your patients will be on OD tacrolimus? Like five, roughly 5%. Five five five, five five okay, next I go to our uh, uh, renowned pediatric nephrologist from All India Institute, Dr. Arvind Baga has got a lot of experience in this field. Um, Dr. Baga, what is your uh, percentage of patients on OD tacrolimus? Uh, so, so it's a minuscule, you know. So we uh, none of our transplant patients, children who have had a transplant, is on OD therapy. Uh, the data in children is is limited, and uh, currently, you know, we are trying to look at uh, the the efficacy of uh, OD therapy. We thought we'll first start with nephrotic syndrome, so we are doing the control. We are doing a trial. Wherein we are looking at the pharmacokinetics, you know, in children, and perhaps with that basis, you know, one could probably be more confident in using them for transplant kids. But our numbers are small, and none of our patients currently are on uh, uh, Thank you, sir. therapy. Thank you. Next, I go to Dr. Ashwini Gupta, my good friend, uh, vice chairman of nephrology for some Gangara Hospital. I know that uh, you work in the same hospital, but uh, both of you have got your own set of patients. I'm sure you will give me some statistics on the number of patients or percent of patients on OD tacrolimus, Dr. Ashwini. Uh, and Dr. Sundar, its uh, experience is the same as told by Dr. Balla, uh, 5%. And recently, uh, we are finding, because we are regularly do, uh, doing that genetic typing, and we are seeing those who are uh, uh, CIP3A inducers and uh, expressors. <coughs> There, I have started converting them very early into an OD dose. Because earlier, we are not able to maintain the level. Instead of uh, monitoring the levels every day, I think it will be more economic to uh, put them on OD dose. And this is what I have started very recently. And uh, I can share the experience later we'll on. Come, uh, because, actually, we'll yeah. come. we got a separate yeah. session for the questions now. Uh, Dr. Uh, Tarun is there? Tarun So my numbers are very small, very, very small, sir. And as everyone has uh, volunteered, it's they are all converted patients, none de novo in my center. So my experience with OD tag is very small. And the reasons all which I again voice, everyone has voiced. So I, I'm also the, of the same opinion. Uh, Dr. Avek, my uh, dynamic uh, secretary of the Indian Society of Organ Transplant. He's everywhere, especially the COVID field. He is now a rock star of uh, COVID and transplant. What is your experience and percentage? Because you run one of the biggest centers of transplant in India. So what would be your uh, percentage of patients on OD tacrolimus? Yes, sir. We have around 10% patients. Our experience is similar to other center. And main, mainly the higher cost of uh, available molecule is a limiting factor for patients in the public sector hospital with a better cost. Uh, I think we, we are coming to that. Uh, we, we are discussing more. the cost. We are going to discuss the cost factor. Now I come last but not least, the chairman of the organizing committee of uh, for the conference, my good friend Abhi Abraham. I'm not seeing him anywhere here. He said he is going to be physically present. Yes, I am at the console. I am at the console. But I'm not able to see your photo or your figure. Uh, yes, yes. You, 
Ah, where, where are you, Abhi? Yeah. Is, okay. Yeah. See, like, uh, okay. uh, I agree with the most of the other panelists. Only my, <clears throat> only five to ten percent of my patients are on uh, once daily tacrolimus, and I usually reserve it for patients who are very high levels, like even with one milligram daily or 0.5 milligram twice daily, they are not able to achieve uh, the level. Meaning, the levels remain very high. Yeah. So I reserve okay. it for that category of patients. Main hindrance was actually the cost. So once okay. the cost, uh, we are going to discuss on yeah. that uh, separately. Now, now I know uh, I got the rough idea from the entire panel now uh, that roughly five to ten percent would be the uh, number of patients on OD tacrolimus, and cost is a factor which is coming in. We'll discuss it later. On. Now I'm going to go in an order of set of questions. I start again with uh, my good friend Balaji. He has mentioned a few points. Where do you prefer to use OD formulation instead of conventional formulation? You gave me some uh, points. Uh, what is your idea of uh, OD tacrolimus? Do you prefer it in de novo or maintenance? High risk versus low risk? Many questions, but I'm sure you'll be able to answer in brief. Yes, the, it has already been partly answered. In I know, fact, I know that. Yes, so five percent of patients indication only being that where the levels are very high and we are not able to reduce the dose to less than 0.25 milligram, uh, as Dr. Thayer mentioned. We tried earlier giving alternate, uh, but that didn't work. So now we have a OD preparation. So uh, that is the most important indication um, with um, my patients. As I already highlighted that adherence or compliance, I don't think is a major problem. And next is a de novo we have not used. And as Ashwini Dr. Ashwini mentioned, we are now doing a thesis, this CYP35 where, and we find if the, uh, it is a fast inducer, then we uh, go for uh, higher dose and OD dose. Okay. And uh, what do you prefer for this OD dose? Uh, I know that most of us are using uh, morning uh, OD dose and uh, scientifically also, if you look at the circadian rhythm and the drug uh, monitoring, it tells us that morning may be ideal, but is, do you think, is there any role for using it in the evening instead of morning or? Morning, you know, some... morning, morning dose morning. because yes, the, uh, giving sample also is much easier for the patient. I think we also use the morning, and as Vijay was saying, we use a combination of single dose tacrolimus with azathioprine and prednisolone, all taken in the morning, especially Bangalore traffic jam. Once you go out, we don't know whether you're going to come back alive back. So in the morning, if you take at least you're taking the dose of medicine. Okay. And another thing is what Dr. Kher mentioned about combination with azathioprine. From the very beginning, actually, from the start of our nephrology training, we have been using azoth azothioprine as at 5 p.m. That's what the standard teaching was. Correct. The reason being was that if the TLC goes low and you want to stop the dose on that day, Correct. so that was the reason. So best is to tell the patient morning dose, take this tablet, evening dose, you take this tablet. Okay. So now I go to the Abhi Abraham. The question is, your comments on targeted, targeted therapeutic drug monitoring, trough levels, frequency of testing with OD formulation. So what is your, how, when do you test? Once you're started on OD tacrolimus, uh, in Dino versus maintenance. I know many of us don't have any experience, much experience in Dino, but what is your protocol for drug monitoring on patients on OD tacrolimus? Is it different from the BD tacrolimus? Abhi Abraham. Most, uh, most of my experience with the conversion, I, I, my experience with the Dino tac is very, very limited. And I, I said, mentioned earlier, I reserve it for patients who are very high levels. So conversion is usually one to one. And then I usually get about, uh, you know, about. Uh, 10 to 20 percent drop in the trough level, which I accept. But when you look at the pharmaco pharmacokinetic studies, actually, uh, you, when you switch to this particular formulation of once daily, even though the trough, trough, uh, trough levels are lower by, by about 20 percent, the actual exposure, if you do an area under the curve, it's almost the same, or the exposure is only just one to two percent less. So I think even if the track levels levels are a bit lower. I think we should be we should be we should accept that because the actual area under the curve is almost similar. So one to one conversion is usually safe for most patients. And then, then I do a level within about a week, and then another level within a month time. Ideally, we should be doing area under the curve, but it's not practical. Even limited area under the curve is not practical in in routine clinical practice. Okay, thank you. I think you are, even the second question was on uh, switching one is to one. You already answered that, so I will not repeat it. The next question goes to our uh, pediatric uh, nephrology colleague, Dr. Uh, Bhagav from All India Institute. Sir, in pediatric setting, 
where would you prefer once daily formulation? You actually, I know the pediatrician even like uh, give twice, thrice. Uh, my HOD, Dr. Vishwanath, uh, believes in giving three, three times of tacrolimus for uh, achieving the levels. So, is there any role for one uh, single dose tacrolimus in your pediatric transplant practice, Dr. Bagga? So, as I said, we don't have too much experience, you know, but clearly, if a single dose works, it would be the preferred mode, you know. Clearly, uh, once daily would be preferred. And I think once we are once we are confident that it's kind of you know that, that we are achieving enough uh, reasonable pharmacokinetic kinetics in children, I think there's no reason not to not to convert. It's possible that at the onset, immediately following the transplant, you know, it will be a difficult thing. But following that, you know, I think in a in a reasonable proportion, provided costs are not a consideration, this could be a feasible uh, options. Thank you, Dr. Vaga. The next question actually comes uh, because you are in the pediatric practice. Do you think there is a role for getting 0.25 milligram uh, of uh, capsule of OD preparation? Because I personally feel it's needed because even with 0.5 OD, many of my patients have high levels and there's no way I'm able to reduce that. In fact, I ask them to take after food to see whether that works and some cases work. So you think, I think there is need, but from your pediatric perspective, do you think 0.25 should come into the market? So one of the problems, you know, with tetrolimus is... Uh, that kids are not able to swallow capsules until they are about three years old. And three years really converts to a weight of over 12 to 13 kgs. So below that age, you know, we are anyway using cyclosporin as a syrup. And since we don't have a syrup, so it's mm -hmm. not really an issue for us at the moment. You know, so that somebody is about 13 kgs, he requires about a milligram at the very minimum, you know. And therefore, I don't think a 0.25 is required. Uh, uh, because we, we really can't use uh, tetrodomus below b below a certain age. So I would probably, I'm quite okay at 0.5 milligrams. Okay. So that's uh, from the pediatric perspective. Then I go to Dr. Ashwini Gupta. This is, uh, do you find any deficient difference in efficacy and overall graft outcomes with BD versus OD tetrodomus? I know that uh, we, our experience is limited. From literature, I think uh, it's uh, quite encouraging. But what is your experience do you think is there any difference between the two formulations? Yes. Uh, uh, it is a uh, once daily dose is not inferior to in, uh, immediate release, as has been shown by Dr. Fuller, various studies, and the uh, latest Osakra and some unknown trial uh, has shown that biopsy confirmed acute rejections, graft outcomes, and infections. There were no difference between the two formulations. And uh, whatever experience we have from conversion, I have found that those who were having very erratic levels uh, with OD dose, now their levels are better, their creatinines are better maintained. And very recently for uh, uh, these fast metabolizers, we have given the OD preparation and we found that uh, there was good stabilization of the levels. Thank you, Ashwini. And um, I think the next question also to you, but you answered in brief. Uh, how does OD formulation fare in safety and adverse if events? And I think you mentioned a little bit. You can yes. uh, give us some more input. Yes, uh, uh, it is as safe as uh, the BD uh, dose and the adverse reactions. Uh, there is no difference. But Astagraph has been uh, shown that it has got... Uh, many hives and uh, more of this uh, dyspnea and angioedema, which is mm -hmm. uh, not seen with other preparations. And rather, it has been uh, uh, not recommended by US FDA for females in liver transplantation. And uh, uh, they have some beneficial role, uh, OD uh, preparations. There are those who have got neurotoxicity. And it is known that... Uh, OD preparations are free or the uh, neurotoxicity is uh, quite less as compared to immediate release. So there it has been uh, proven to be beneficial. Thank you, Ashwini. Next goes to Dr. Vivek. I think there are two questions which you can combine. Uh, intrapatient variability. How critical is this as a factor in deciding graft outcomes in kidney transplant? And in your experience, does OD formulation help in reducing the intrapatient variation. Dr. Dinesh gave an excellent talk and analyzed all this, but I would want your personal experience on these two questions. Yes, uh, Dr. Fuller has already pointed out on his discussion. In our experience, there is no impact of OD in IPV, and definitely it has a beneficial role. 
in intrapersonal marriage okay thank you vivek and uh, i go to tarun and uh, for the uh, sake of brevity and we know that uh, we are running late i would combine both the questions you can take it uh, tarun is there a long term benefit of od formulation in improving renal function uh, and other clinical parameters i think uh, dinesh did mention about lipid control and is adherence and compliance better in patients with od form formulation compared to bd uh, your own personal experience right. tarun so uh, yes uh, i would say adherence definitely is better with once a day preparation and despite all those advantages which was mentioned or highlighted by dr kuller like uh, improvement or decrease in intra patient variability uh, improvement in adherence and even uh, decrease in biopsy proven acute rejection within one year unfortunately long term studies have did, did not show any patient survival benefit or graft survival benefit or even in serum creatinine so unfortunately this molecule despite having short term advantages have not converted the advantage into long term benefits like patient or graft survival and uh, even uh, renal function uh, as monitored by serum creatinine that is a little unfortunate part of this molecule okay tarun now i go to an important factor i think uh, especially vijay he has worked on costing of uh, immunosuppression transplants and he has got his own low cost uh, transplant immunosuppression protocol Uh, do you think the cost is an important factor in uh, uh, using this drug no uh, i i think cost is remains the most important factor which determines what kind of immunosuppression we use there is no doubt that we would want, want to use the best immunosuppression which has the best efficacy and is cost effective uh, and for patients have to pay from their pockets and therefore cost mm-hmm. becomes and i think Uh, anil was talking about non adherence or non compliance mm. being less of an issue in india but i think cost determines that non compliance yes. in many of yes, our patients mm-hmm. very poor patients so it's not it's not it may not be 30% but it is still there and most of the important factor which determines that non compliance is the cost factor in the, in our country so cost becomes very important and i think adventa being almost priced at the same price as the regular tecrolimus i think uh, that would make this drug to be a drug which is worthy of study by us and i think we should be using this drug more of i think that needs oh, to be okay thank you vijay and um, uh, the, this question is uh, about uh, a publication dr sharma be you coming from an academic institution like sgpji and done lot of work is there do you think is there real dearth of published data real world evidence in indian patients on existing od formulation and do you think we should have uh, more sort of i think we are going to do a study we did discuss that do you think what is your opinion on more publication on this subject i think there is a dearth of data and uh, uh, especially if you want to look at the interplay of these factors like the uh, genetic variations uh, how they could be interacting even uh, the tac uh, mmf interaction uh, which is different with different genetic uh, variations so on top of it we are using single dose uh, uh, molecule which has not been used uh, on a large scale though it was in market uh, internationally for quite some time and also this uh, genetic variation is also different in different parts of india like in northern india you find much more so you really have uh, uh, need to have publications so that we become comfortable and fine tune uh, the use of this molecule uh so that data has to come up and uh, i think we need a multicentric study and also regional studies and also do the uh, genetic variations and the uh, pharmacodynamics and link these two together so i think that's a, there is a dearth of data so i think in a brief we need our experience based medicine become evidence based so unless they publish and how articles is not going to become evidence in the real world now uh, dinesh you are trying to say something yeah so this is a clarification dr sundar uh, this is uh, <clears throat> in response to what dr bhalla had said so you see don't get me wrong i didn't say that non compliance is to the tune of 50% is the other way around people who develop de novo uh, right. donor specific antibodies and had chronic uh, antibody mediated rejection found to be non compliance was the culprit in good up to 50% the range was 7 to 50% 
but then you cannot go away from the fact that non compliance plays a big role when things go wrong so is the other way around i'm not saying that 50% of patients are non compliant that's one secondly i wanted to give a, a a kind of very common situation your patient is at tac levels of of between 5 and 6 at 6 months post transplantation you may be quite comfortable now i'll give you that this patient could be having high intra patient variability non compliance is just one of the factors it could be food food i have showed that beautiful uh, uh, list uh, which i think everyone must remember it could be those herbal medicines it could be mm. fruit juice it could be anything now you are happy that your patient is at 6 the intra patient variability could be 40% that makes the levels could be less than 4 without you having made any change in the drug dosage and look at where your patient could be if the levels fall to less than 4 within 6 months of transplantation so that's the point i wanted to highlight that before going in for things like blatacept and all those uh, new uh, let's try to get the maximum out of a very potent thing which we have and that's tetralimus totally agreed we need more data the data of course is is coming up as you had seen the 10 year data has started talking about not just the better compliance but also dose reduction but this dose reduction is mainly with envarsives we have the other formulation here and and obviously one big advantage which we now have is that cost is at par with the uh, twice a day formulation so we are definitely going to have more and more data now okay now uh, if there are no i think uh, we are already past time and there are no questions in the chat box so i would like to summarize the whole we had a galaxy of speakers the basic thing is one is we do not use commonly deno still we don't have experience in deno transplant mostly it is conversion conversion is one is to one roughly 5 to 10% of our patients on tacrolimus are on od dosage of od tacrolimus and the other point to be noted is compliance is based on cost so if you want to increase the use of od tacrolimus even from the uh, from the company perspective one way is to keep the cost low and uh, as i as vijay rightly said Uh, getting the good product at low price so vijay wants a rolls royce at the cost of a maruti alto so if that is done i'm sure the product will be done well and that is true in medicine in uh, all setup and everything in life so i would like to thank my excellent panelists and chairpersons and speaker for this session i would like to thank uh, the organizers dr vivek kuti abhi abraham my good friend uh, for giving me an opportunity to moderate this important session uh, because this is an important aspect of transplantation compliance and using od tactics thank you very much thank you to thank you dr sundar uh, thank you thank you sir especially thank the panelists and the moderator for the wonderful panel discussion